What do you think the impact of the ETF is on the forward fundamentals of Bitcoin? Well, I mean, it's just, just a structural up, sh uh, up move. So you said 4X is what it is? Yeah, so that would be 200,000, 240 from 60 today? Yeah, two, 200,000 over the 18 months from the halving. Yeah, so. I think that's reasonable. I mean, if you think about it, it's only, what, 3, 4X? I mean, <laughs> it's not that big a deal for Bitcoin and certainly for assets in this space. Yeah. I mean, historically, it's just the numbers are now getting really big, you know, trillions. The world's largest cryptocurrency by market capitalization is now trading above $70,000, following its highest daily close in 10 days on Monday. The first Wall Street trading session of the week brought a shift in sentiment for Bitcoin and spot Bitcoin ETFs, with the leading digital asset gaining nearly $5,000 in a single day. Despite a challenging period last week, spot Bitcoin ETFs are back in positive territory with net inflows of $15 million recorded on Monday, as reported by a chart from Farside Investors, a London-based investment management company. Among the spot Bitcoin ETFs, Fidelity's FBTC led with $261.5 million in inflows, followed by BlackRock's iBite at $35.5 million. However, GBTC recorded $35.1 million in outflows. Despite market volatility, the spot Bitcoin ETFs are making a strong recovery with further rebounds anticipated as the market approaches the upcoming halving event in April. At the 2024 Digital Assets Summit in London, Skybridge Capital's Anthony Scaramucci and Dan Tapiero of 10T Holdings engaged in a live panel discussion. Tapiero, a respected macro investor with over three decades of experience, presented the macro case for Bitcoin, labeling it as the best asymmetric upside opportunity he's witnessed in 30 years. Tapiero explained that transitioning from traditional asset classes like the S&P to store of value assets like gold was relatively straightforward due to his understanding of the macroeconomic landscape and the deteriorating state of fiat currencies. Tapiero emphasized that compared to top stock indexes, which have seen declines of up to 99%, Bitcoin emerged as an obvious choice for investment. With central banks poised to implement rate cuts and increase money printing, there is significant demand for spot Bitcoin ETFs. Uh, Tapiero and Scaramucci are particularly bullish on Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies in 2024 and beyond, given the favorable macroeconomic conditions. It's easy and sort of boring a little bit. I mean, the ETF, um, you know, everyone's heard a lot about it, but it's, you know, you've onboarded literally tens of trillions of dollars of value uh, sitting in global equity accounts that can now just push a button and own Bitcoin. So it's as if Coinbase, in effect, over, overnight, you know, added 100 million MAUs or whatever it is. And um, I think it's a very powerful trend. It's the first inning of it. Um, I have, you know, many investors, very sophisticated, uh, tens of millions of dollars in my fund. And they've said to me, you know, guys in their 50s, 60s, I I'm not going to open up an account on Coinbase or Kraken and by the way, I'm just going to wait for the ETF. This is for years they've been saying this. I want to see it in my stock account. I want my broker to look at it. I mean, it's crazy, but it's the, it's the American investor's nature. And so I think it continues for a, a long time. And we haven't seen such a, uh, anything that's been so concentrated from the demand side. You know, it's like a, there's like a little a bridge and the entire U.S. wealth management world is trying to cross this little bridge into, into the new world. Even if you don't understand it, it's the old Wences Casares idea, get off zero, which is to say that you don't understand it, you don't know what's going on here, but do you really want to have zero exposure? Why don't you just put 1% in, dip your toe, and so if everyone's dipping their toe at the same time, a lot of money. right. And I think that's what's going on. There's a natural progression. People buy Bitcoin initially. They see it. Hopefully it moves up. They have it in their account. Maybe they forget about it. It's doing something. Then they look at Ethereum and then that's usually the next one. And then people start investigating the space more deeply. I had uh, in 2019. So I chair the investment committee of a school. Um, just, you know, charitably, and it's actually quite a large endowment. And 
I convinced the committee to put 1% of the endowment. And it, it took me a while. And there's some very well-known people on this committee and they're you know, running major banks. And you know, these are guys who've known me you know, for 30, actually more, 40 years. And they're like, Dan, we, we know you, we love this. Anyway, it took me two hours and I had some help as well from uh, another person to convince them to put 1% of the endowment and into Bitcoin and ETH. And we did in the first half of 19, the 5 million went to 58 million. Everyone was trying to you know, sell and they were like, oh my goodness, this has blown out the performance of the endowment, the best performing uh, high school endowment in the US. And then it went down to 13. And you know, Dan, what did you do to us? Still up you know, at 2x. <laughs> It's now, I don't know, over 60 million and everyone knows I haven't gotten a single message on it yet because I said, look, we're going to buy it and we're going to hold it for 10 years. And I don't want to hear about it for 10 years. You know, I was in this ballroom in 1985. I was eating prawns. They were terrible. I was a student at the London School of Economics. I was living in, in Paddington. And you, to make a phone call to my parents, I had to call them on Wednesdays because that was like Prince Spaghetti Day. And so I had to call my mother on a Wednesday, let her know I was safe and blah, blah. And I had, a, I had to get a, uh, a phone card and I had to punch in the numbers. And it was $5 a minute to make the call. And today it's $0 a minute. You're transacting with your bank. And I don't know what they're charging you. Or maybe you have a lot of money in your bank, so they're not charging you. But the average person is either unbanked or they're getting hit with a lot of fees. But over the Lightning Network or over the blockchain, like the phone system, it's going to zero. And if you don't see that, okay, but I want you to see it because that's where the future is going to be. The same way uh, in 1985, the future changed as a result of the innovations related to the Internet. In January, Robbie Michnick, I don't know if anybody knows who he is, but he was on the Bitcoin project at Blackstone. And I ran into Larry Fink in uh, the Four Seasons Hotel, Al Mariana Island in Abu Dhabi. And this was Abu Dhabi Finance Week. So this is probably November of 22, maybe October, something like that. And I'm in the lobby with him. And he says, hey, hey, you like, you like Bitcoin? I said, I do. Because oh, I think Bitcoin sucks. Larry Fink. I just made this big investment in Circle. I love stable coins. I said, okay, so you have to do more homework on this because anybody that does the homework, anybody that does the Tapiero-like fundamental homework, it's a one-way ticket towards the asset. You're not doing the homework and saying, oh, you know, I'm not buying the asset. And so Larry, to his credit, did the homework, sends Robbie Michnick to see me. Robbie says to me, this place is very bureaucratic. If I don't get outside money into this BlackRock Bitcoin Trust, they're going to kill the project. And I think you know my partner, Brett Messing, right? So he's our chief investment officer. And so he wired Robbie $10 million. Skybridge was the first outside money into the BlackRock Bitcoin Trust prior to its application filing for the ETF. Well done. And yeah, I'm not, I'm not patting ourselves on the back. I'm just telling you, it was at the bottom of the market. Nobody wanted it. BlackRock was defensive. It is the largest ETF launch in the history of BlackRock. Again, apply context. You've had good days in your life and you've had bad days in your life. But when you're having the bad day, you got to keep going. You know, we didn't know if we were going to stay in business, not stay in business. I'm in Brioni today, but I thought, man, I'm heading for a barrel and suspenders. I mean, this could be really <laughs> bad for me and my family. But when you're in, what did Churchill say? When you're in hell, when you're going through hell, keep going. And, 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 and believe, if you've done the homework, you've got to believe in yourself.